Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another installment of Medieval History with your very own host, Mr. Rich. Thank you, thank you. Hold your applause. Tonight we'll be discussing the era of Constantine. We just recently finished discussing the rise of Constantine. Now we're going to be discussing some of the aspects of his reign and especially his effects on the church. To begin, let's start looking at Constantine's as a, Constantine as a statesman. He was perhaps one of the best that had ever lived. If we take a look at this map, we can see as the color changes from life, uh, left to right the territories he was able to gain control of. And just looking at it gives you a sense that this man was not moving um, haphazardly through his own life. He was calculating, careful, and strategic. His, um, as we've said before, his victory at Milvian Bridge um, was accomplished with about a quarter of his troops. What we learned from that is this guy never took risks um, that were inordinate. He knew what he was doing and made sure his flanks were always covered and carefully, slowly, but surely uh, gained control over the entirety of the Roman Empire. And he was the first in several generations to be able to do such a thing. As emperor of the whole kit and caboodle, he uh, first moved his capital away from Rome. Now this is a sharp break um, in history. He's the only emperor so far to have done anything like this. Uh, moves it all the way across uh, Greece into um, what's called Byzantium or Con uh, Constantinople. Literally, Constantinople would mean, of course, the city of Constantine. Now, why would he do this? All right, well, a couple of reasons. First of all, I didn't want to get too far away from the western part of the empire. All right? The western part of the empire, of course, is where he had to deal with the Germanic barbarian tribes. They were still pressing up there. You can see that line um, that roughly is following the Rhine up there in the uh, west near Germany. And the barbarians were still pressing. And so defending that border, um, def defending that limes was... Uh, still utmost priority, and he needed to be close enough that he could do that. There was also the, the border of the Danube, which if you go uh, a little south and east from that oval, you'll see that outline is kind of following the Danube. So his headquarters there enabled him to defend the, the borders along the Danube and the Rhine still. However, it also got him real close to some big money. Okay, this is the Black Sea up here, or the Euxine. And it was um, a source of great trade, okay? A lot, of, um, a lot of merchant vessels would go from Mediterranean regions bearing goods to sell or trade up here in these um, uh, Black Sea city ports. Well, being stationed where he is there, right between the only narrow pass to get from the Black Sea to the Mediterranean, meant big, big bucks. I mean, it was like, and maybe I've said this before, but it's like being the only uh, gas station on a 100-mile stretch of I-65. You know, I mean, people have had to pee for a long time, and they're really hungry for a Snickers bar, and you're the only gig in town. That means you can charge whatever you want, right? You can charge them to use your bathroom if you want. Um, when you're the only gig in town. So being located right there is uh, very strategic, both economically. And then the other thing, of course, he's got this eastern threat. The Persian Empire has sort of risen again from the ashes and is has been, uh, up until Constantine's time, under a treaty with Rome, that which kind of prevented them from advancing, but that treaty was coming to an end, and Constantine knew that the eastern border was going to be something he had to carefully defend. So he moves it um, out to Constantinople. And Byzantium, or Constantinople, is going to far outlast Rome in the end. This uh, We'll talk about this more at a later lecture, but the eastern half of the empire was far more economically stable and advanced than the western half. The western half is a little bit country, a little bit, a little bit backward in some respects, okay? Um, but the old wealth on the eastern side enabled that side of the empire to last uh, hundreds of years into the Middle Ages, whereas the history of Rome, as we're going to see soon, ended around 410 or shortly thereafter. Other thing he did was going out to Byzantium, he needed a little bit bigger walls than the city had, so he, um, in a kind of a great pomp ceremony, took his sword, dragged it through the soil, and carved out much, much bigger uh, boundaries. But this city was to become so important and so um, so successful 
that um, not two emperors later, he was going to, the city boundaries would get even bigger. So this was a very successful city project of Constantine's. As soon as he got there, as soon as he marked up these walls, he started to build. He started to build um, all over the place. But um, some of the more interesting things that he built were, of course, churches. Here is the Hagia Irene. It's a basilica uh, devoted to the attribute of God as the God of peace. Um, but interestingly about the rebuilding campaign in um, Constantinople, it often was done with structures uh, like sculptures, brick, even from other cities. So Constantine was literally looting other cities in his empire to build this new capital in Byzantium. Now this marked, um, with, the, with the building of these churches, there's a new kind of architecture really, because never before have uh, Christians been building worship centers that are sort of directly devoted to their needs. Prior to this, we have, of course, the pagan temple. Now the pagan temple was designed mostly for the action to be taking place on the outside, because you know pagan temple is a place of sacrifice. So yes, there is a deity's image inside. Yes, there is a treasury in there, but the sacrifices and all the main action, that's all taking place outside. Well, Christianity just sort of reverses that all together. The sacrifice, if that's what you want to call communion, the, of Christianity takes place inside. Not only inside, but only within the view of a certain uh, elite few. Um, you might want to call Christianity a kind of mystery religion in this sense that it was only available to the initiated. Right? You had to be baptized even to watch the Eucharist take place. Now, it was not a mystery religion in the sense that you had to have some kind of secret knowledge. Of course, we've talked before about how the Gospels are a public proclamation of the teachings of Christianity, and in this way, um, a, a force against the heresy of Gnosticism, which was indeed a kind of mystery religion in the sense that it's a mystery that anybody could understand what they were talking about. But Christianity was a mystery religion in the sense that to get inside, to, to be part of the the ceremony. You actually had to go through a pretty rigorous training. Uh, you had to go, you had to be baptized, and then you could be admitted to this service. So these buildings were now designed so that all the action and all the interesting um, ceremony was going to be taking place inside, and that's uh, where we get the basilica form. Okay, the basilica form here, the one on the top is actually the layout of the Hagia Irene, and there you can see the nave would be where most of the congregation would sit. And in the apse there, the far right, is where the Lord's Supper would take place, the Eucharist or the Communion. That had originally been um, for legal proceedings. The apse had been the place where the emperor would sit and um, hear legal proceedings, hear uh, you make pronouncements from there, you know, make decisions. Um, the nave... Okay, was designed for audience, uh, for citizens of, of Rome to actually be able to witness and see, hear from, possibly interact with the emperor. Now all of this had been devoted to Christian worship. So instead of having the emperor there, you would have a kind of altar in the apse, uh, usually on raised on what's called a bema or a stage. There would be the, um, the central act of Christian worship. That would be the place where the Eucharist took place. And in the nave would be all of the uh, baptized believers who could witness and participate in this. Now, this all raises a question. Okay, Constantine comes in, he, he's victorious at Milvian Bridge on account of, you know, at least by his, his understanding, on account of the Christian God. And he seems to be very eager to support um, Christianity. And, and he had many in his entourage that would follow him around who were high-ranking church officials, bishops and the like. Uh, members of his own family were converts to Christianity. And the question is, was he? Was Constantine, in fact, a Christian? Now, much has been said about Constantine's faith or lack thereof. Uh, in his day, for sure, he was celebrated as a hero of the Christian faith. Many writers and ch uh, church leaders kind of lauded him as God's chosen vessel. Um, others, however, since then, have kind of questioned that and said, you know what, he might just have been kind of an opportunist, the guy who faked his conversion to Christianity to try to gain some kind of political advantage in this thing. After all, we've said he was a consummate statesman. Um, maybe this is just one more calculating strategic move on his part to gain power. 
let's look at the evidence. There is evidence against his ever having a true um, conversion. First, he never really submitted to church authority. Uh, the bishops and the like were part of his entourage. They might have been consultants, but he sort of understood himself to ex be a bishop of bishops, if you want. And even at the Council of Nicaea, he was the presiding authority there. He was the one who could convene these things. He could disperse them if he wanted as well. Similarly, he was also the high authority of pagan uh, ritual and pagan religion. He was still the high priest in Rome of the pagan cult. So he continued to work in these pagan rituals. And you will remember that for the Romans, this kind of syncretism wasn't really a problem. Uh, you know, if you're a Roman and you're a polytheist and this new god comes into town and it seems the new god has power, then by all means, you know, you're supposed to worship that god and get him on your side. Thirdly, Constantine was never baptized, not until his dying day. Um, why? What's going on there? Uh, your guess is as good as mine. But the point is, he never really submitted to baptism, which makes sort of, sort of like disqualifies him right from the outset as being a true convert to Christianity. Lastly, we need to remember Galerius. Galerius and what we could call general pagan piety. As I mentioned before, um, the Romans believed that if a god existed, it was your responsibility as a mortal to honor them and worship them. In fact, it was to your advantage to do so. And this is why Galerius, in 311 on his deathbed, issued the Edict of Toleration. He was trying to uh, appease every god possible so that he could recover from this deathly sickness. It is entirely possible that Constantine understood the Christian god in the same way. He had helped him win the Milvian Bridge battle. He had helped him win against Licinius. And he was giving him success at every corner. So, yeah, keep honoring this god. But maybe don't neglect the others as well. But that's too simple of a story. To say he just didn't convert to true Christianity. Does that make him, therefore, an opportunist? I think not. Um, if we look at the other side of this, we can see that there are... Um, he's not just an opportunist. He wasn't just someone using Christianity for his own gains. The last point I made against his conversion could also be leveled against opportunism because he did have a kind of real genuine piety for the Christian God. He thought that Christian God had power, and so he genuinely respected the Christian God and wanted that Christian God to be happy. Now, did he understand that Christian God's um, exclusive right to worship? Uh, did he understand the deity of Christ or the saving nature of faith? Possibly not. But in the end, he did respect and believe in this Christian God. Um, keep in mind that at the Milvian Bridge in Rome, paganism was still very strong. In fact, far stronger really than Christianity at the time. To have tried to leverage the support of the church in Rome, was it would have just been ill-timed to say the least. Uh, Christianity was strongest in the East. If he had really wanted to use Christianity, he probably would have hesitated and waited until he'd started fighting in the East. That would have been the place where he would be more likely to get support. However, point four here, Christians were terrible about being in the army. We already know that they had, um, they had a serious qualms with fighting in the Roman army. Um, there were, and there were all kinds of requirements at different times about having to, you know, offer incense and prove your allegiance to the emperor and all this kind of thing. Plus, to say nothing of the fact that, you know, their teacher had said, turn the other cheek. So the Christians were unreliable in the army. So why would he go to them for support? Lastly, Christianity was a religion of the poor, the poor and women for the longest time. It was why they were lambasted. It was why they were ridiculed by Roman elites. Why would, uh, if he was just using Christianity, why would Constantine have joined himself to some of the weakest elements of Roman society. In the end, Constantine was a king, a statesman, an emperor. Um, was he affecting serious religious chains? Yes, but he was not another Akhenaten. Okay? He was not trying to bring about a total revital, uh, revamping of Rome's religious culture. He knew very well that that would have been a disaster, as it was for Akhenaten. But he also didn't see Christianity as a bunch of hocus-pocus. Okay? He saw it as something uh, true and, and serious, and he took it seriously, but he took it seriously as a pagan. 
This is a great quote from a historian I like to read named Justo Gonzalez. The truth is probably that Constantine was a sincere believer in the power of Christ. So, yes, did he believe? Sure, enough to mark his shields, enough to trust God uh, or Christ even with uh, the success in military battle. Um, but whether he understood the true importance of Jesus as his savior and as the only hope of the world, well, that's something that only Constantine and God can know for sure. Next, let's turn our attention to Constantine's influence on the church and worship. Uh, this is going to be kind of the basis for some future discussions, I hope, on the nature of Christian worship, especially the kind of trappings of it, the sort of buildings that it takes place in, the sort of music that is used, and even into issues like church government and the nature of church leadership and church uh, participation by ordinary common people like you and me. First, let's look at the way things were before Constantine. Now, early before Constantine, long before Constantine, you know, Christians didn't even have regular meeting houses. Instead, they, they had to go find whatever was available, and they would often, you know, kind of resort to uh, cemeteries and catacombs. The re use of these catacombs was twofold. One, it was close to some of the saints that they um, honored and respected. You know, guys like Polycarp would have been down there, and to commemorate Polycarp's, Polycarp's martyrdom, on the day he had died, you would go down into the catacomb and, and have your kind of communion service there right around his body as a, as a means of encouragement, not, as, not in any kind of way associated with magic necessarily. It was also safe because if you were in a place that was hostile to Christianity and you went down in the catacombs, you didn't have a lot of company. Uh, it wasn't a popular place for Romans to just, you know, spend their free time. So when Christians would kind of go down there under the cover of darkness, they stood a better chance of being able to hold their worship service without being noticed or accused before the local officials. Now, these catacombs eventually gave way to more permanent dwellings, like this one here that's depicted um, in a drawing um, that was found in a place called Dura Europus. Now, Dura Europus is in Syria, and um, this was probably the house of a you know upper-middle-class um, Roman citizen who, being converted to Christianity, decided to vote, devote their house to um, Christian worship. The layout was very simple. Um, you had you know, an assembly room, a place where you could uh, have the Lord's Supper. You had a teaching area. And then, importantly, you would have a special spot for holding baptisms. Um, this baptism, baptismal area would have been Im very important, like I said, but decorated nicely. Um, this is a kind of reconstruction of it. And it was important because undergoing baptism in the early church was a big deal. I mean, it would take, uh, it, first of all, it was only done a couple of times a year. So it was usually done on Easter and maybe one other time. And so if you wanted to be baptized, you had to go through this rigorous and quite long process of discipleship and training and education. Not because, again, you had to have some kind of secret knowledge, but because the church leaders wanted to make sure that you understood the true gospel and to hopefully protect you against many of the heresies that were running rampant at the time. This is to say nothing of the fact that undergoing baptism could mean eventual martyrdom. So Christians who undertook this ceremony, um, they, had a lot, they had a lot more to think about, perhaps, than we do today uh, when we do it. This is what Dura Europus actually looks like today. This is the sort of ruins. It's a side view, so it's not very helpful, but um, the layout has been mapped and studied, and, and they've been able to reconstruct quite a bit of it today. Now, what happened when Constantine came along? Well, this is where we get the humorous term smells and bells, right? You've heard, of, maybe you've been to a church like this where um, everything around you is, is sort of part of the worship service. There's, a, there's smoke in the air, there's a choir, there's beautiful stained glass windows, high ceilings, and all of this. Well, much of this came into being after the after Constantine's reign, because it was only after his reign that the church had the kind of legitimacy it needed to develop these sort of practices. So let's look at a few of these. One is the use of incense. Here we have uh, this guy swinging his canister of incense that's, you know, like slowly burning inside and shaking it back and forth and filling the place with this fragrant aroma. Um, 
I can still remember the headache I had the first time I was at a Greek Orthodox church and uh, the guy went all through shaking that thing and it just totally filled the place, right? Well, many people have said that's, you know, it's a great image of the spirit or of God or the holiness of God kind of filling the space you're in, sort of reminiscent maybe of that, you know, scene in Isaiah when the glory of the Lord fills the temple. But why did it come about? Well, it came about because the Romans had been burning incense to Caesar for a long time, right? That It had been a part of the imperial cult worship to burn incense both in his presence and to his image. And so when Christianity gained the ascendancy, they took the same practice, but they directed it to the one true God. Similarly, similarly, ministers began to change. Ministers began to look a lot more like Roman magistrates or officials who had very particular kinds of clothing they would wear to distinguish them from your common citizen. So uh, the use of vestments, which is what we typically call the things like the stole and the robe and maybe even the hat, um, these things came into play when church ministers became an part of Roman uh, government, not necessarily as magistrates, but as advisors to the emperor, right? So these people um, rose, in their importance, rose in their importance and their dress began to reflect that. And they began to look a lot more, like I said, like Roman officials. And when these folks would enter the church, they did so to great pomp and circumstance. Ordinarily, you know, the Christians had gathered in these humble homes, uh, had read scriptures together. Maybe there was a leader, but things generally had to be done fairly quietly. Now they could be done in the open to great celebration. So the uh, ministers would come in, decked out in their vestments, shaking the incense all around. And of course, they needed something to accompany their procession. So they created these choirs to provide musical accompaniment. Lastly, the church buildings themselves began to undergo a dramatic change. And as we've said before, um, these basilicas began to arise, uh, focusing again. Here we, we can see the focus. You can even feel it. Like all of the movement of this architecture aims at that apse in the back where the Lord's Supper was celebrated. So still, this kind of central focus on the Lord's Supper, but now a much bigger area to do that in. Far more people observing this and the beauty of the surroundings and the whole, like I said, the trappings of your worship service had changed dramatically over time. Reactions to this, these changes were not always positive, right? Um, as today, we have groups like the Amish or the Mennonites um, reacting against changes in culture, seeing their faith as a faith of the old traditions, so choosing to maintain kind of the old ways against the changing tides of culture. So in the, in the ancient world, there were reactions against the changes in church culture. And uh, here pictured is a, is a representation of what's called a desert monk. Many of early Christians saw the ease and the luxury, the pomp and the circumstance as all harmful to Christianity, and so um, decided to separate themselves from it entirely. More on that later, but I, what I do want you to begin thinking about is how do you understand these changes? What does your church look like? How has your church been affected by the changing tides of culture? I doubt many of you go to a basilica to worship, um, but what does your house of worship look like? How is it arranged? What's the shape? Where is the center of attention? What's the central event in a worship service? Hopefully as we move through the historical development of Christianity and see the changes and see the way that different people reacted to it, we'll be better equipped for deciding how we want to deal with uh, these changes in our own lives. But more on that later. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you soon.